No, actually, don't explain that. No, in, in English. But you, you know the French word the from French, the yeah. from yeah. that Max French. Exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, it fits a great many countries, including yours. Good, so I think we're ready to begin. I uh, want to welcome you to uh, our seminar today. We're extremely fortunate to have one of the most distinguished Africanist political scientists of our time, uh, Richard Joseph, um, who is the John Evans Professor of International History and Politics at Northwestern University, to speak to us today on democratic transitions and development in Africa. Uh, beyond prebendalist systems. I guess you massage the title, but in, in, we're still in the same arena. And the key word is prebendalist. Uh, Richard, I think, has written probably the most significant political science book on Nigeria that's been written. It really uh, transformed, in a way, thinking about African politics more generally by applying this concept of prebendalism from Max Weber's work to the logic of politics and governance, or the illogic, depending on how you work on it, uh, look at it, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and um, that book published in 1987, Democracy and Prebendal Politics in Nigeria, heavily shaped um, uh, much future writing about uh, Nigerian politics and African politics, and the phenomenon of really resilient endemic corruption uh, in emerging uh, political systems and oil-based economies in, and so on, uh, more broadly even uh, beyond Africa. And its impact has been so great that now, 25 years after its publication, a group of a uh, number of the leading social scientists in Nigeria have gathered together for a conference, I guess, last year to uh, ponder its continuing salience and lessons and um, reapplications to the Nigerian context and are doing a, a follow-up volume in which Richard will contribute the epilogue, and I'm very honored to contribute the preface that will be published, um, uh, I guess, later this year or next uh, by Paul Grave. Richard um, is a very distinguished scholar of African politics and development and has been uh, a policy intellectual, and to some extent an activist in this as well. His career uh, began with the study of Cameroon and his very widely acclaimed book, Radical Nationalism in Cameroon, published in 1977, and then the book I mentioned on Nigeria, and a number of edited books, the most recent one of which I think is Smart Aid for African Development, which brought together a number of scholars to rethink um, the uh, problematic aid relationship between countries like the United States uh, and European countries in Africa. He's been an activist uh, uh, in a number of ways. Uh, one of the most seminal ones was his many years at the Carter Center in Atlanta where he uh, built up the program, uh, really launched uh, with President Carter the program on um, uh, African governance, African governance uh, and uh, was a, a seminal figure in monitoring elections and uh, really uh, helping not only to observe but in ways that probably even haven't been fully revealed yet, let's say facilitate uh, some transitions out of conflict or authoritarianism into at least democratic possibilities uh, in Africa. And um, that spawned a whole variety of work uh, that continues from the Carter Center and elsewhere uh, and uh, that has found its way into uh, print. Uh, he was particularly known for his coordination of election missions in Zambia in 91, Ghana in 92, and the peace initiatives in Liberia uh, during several years in the early 1990s. Um, he's got too many awards to mention. He's been a Rhodes Scholar. He got his DPhil from Oxford. Uh, he's had a Kent Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship. We'd love to have you be a fellow sometime <laughs> here at Stanford. And Richard, I won't steal any more of your time, but thank you for coming back to CDDRL to okay. share your thinking and work with us. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure um, being here and coming back again. And thank you, 
um, very much, um, Larry, and to see um, um, a number of you present. Um, um, as you will see, um, uh, you know, um, I'll be, uh, I was telling uh, Francis Fukuyama that I can have another sub Fukuyama, and you all will see uh, as, we, as, we, as we move along. Um, when Larry said that uh, there are some things not revealed, um, uh, I am, in fact, after I finish some commitments, um, moving um, to get some writing I've been promising done. Um, the first one will be, um, you know, writing a book that distills my ideas on state democracy and development. Um, a second one will be talking about the involvement with President Carter on a number of issues. And then the third one is writing another book on Nigeria. So I just let you know that um, those um, uh, are commitments um, to be met. Now, um, this presentation, um, it um, will serve a number of purposes. Of course, first of all, is being able to engage um, with those of you present here. Um, but also, as Larry mentioned, that we do have this um, book that's in preparation. Um, and so part of this, when I finish this, this summer I'll be writing my um, epilogue to the book. But also, and I'm very glad to see that um, Stanford um, is moving forward um, as MIT has paved the way um, of making available um, more widely um, what actually goes on in our campuses. And so I have created a website called Africa Plus, um, and so my talks and a lot of materials are being presented there to make it available um, to scholars. So I have more material here that's really intended for your use, even though it will be available in the PowerPoint um, and being shared. Um, first, some introductory remarks. Uh, the notion of prebendalism came to me fairly suddenly in 1978-79 while conducting research in Nigeria on the transition to civilian rule after over a decade of military government. I first advanced the concept in a 1983 article that became a book chapter, and it featured centrally, as Larry said, in my 1987 book, Democracy and Prebendal Politics, The Rise and Fall of the Second Republic. In September 2011, a conference was convened in Lagos, Nigeria, to discuss the book and its continued significance. And as Larry mentioned, there's a volume being edited by Wale Adebanwi and Ebenezer Obadare on democracy and prebendalism in Nigeria, critical reinterpretations. In a reference letter written on my behalf in 1988, the late J. Sylvester Whitaker, one of the foremost students known to many of you, of politics and society in northern Nigeria, stated that he could not predict how much of a shelf life the concept of prebendalism would have. After a quarter century, the concept is no longer just sitting on the shelf. I will suggest that it is even more significant today for analyzing state governance and political economy in core as well as peripheral capitalist countries. So, so much for early concerns about whether the concept traveled. As will be shown, it has traveled through time and space and is increasingly evident in governments nearest all of us. In the case of Nigeria, one commentator co captured its pertinence by describing the 1987 study, first published in a Nigerian edition in 1991, as, quote, a living book. Nigerians are quick to understand prebendalism because it reflects essential practices and dire consequences of politics throughout the Federation. Juan Linz and Alfred Stepan, in their seminal article, which I know many of you have read, to what consolidated democracies, identified one of the key obstacles to consolidating democracy that I first sensed in Nigeria in the late 1970s. No state, no democracy. Stateness, which they refer in the same article as a usable state, an effective state, a Weberian state, is one of their minimal conditions for a successful democratic transition. In the midst of a complex transition to Nigeria's Second Republic, I realized that it was something fundamentally amiss. In brief, the uses to which Nigerians at all levels of society were putting the state, rep that were putting the state represented a major obstacle to the creation of a usable or effective state. No effective state, I would now say, no effective democracy.
Francis Fukuyama's The Origins of Political Order from Pre-Human Times to the French Revolution has brought our understanding of this basic dilemma to an entirely new level. His second volume is therefore eagerly awaited. The preparation of this talk was influenced <laughs> by me as well. <laughs> the preparation of, and you know, do everything to facilitate that. You know, he should have a, a, you know, a cordon of bodyguards whenever, wherever he goes. The preparation of this talk was influenced greatly by a series of events. The September 11 Lagos Conference on Prebendalism, Fukuyama's origins, the national strike and outpouring of vehement criticisms of Nigeria's corrupt and dysfunctional politics in January 2012, and the declining performance of governments worldwide that can be attributed to an increasing degree to the capturing or prebendalizing of government offices by private interests. The latter process is accelerating as much from domestic dynamics as the intensifying corporate competition to acquire productive and other market assets in overseas and especially emerging economies. Although Fukuyama's analysis nominally ends at the French Revolution of 1789, the first volume shines a spotlight on contemporary developments. With regard to patrimonialism, and its prebendal subtypes, Origins tells us more than any study I have read since delving into Max Weber's classic writings to make sense of state, social, and economic dynamics in Nigeria. In the PowerPoint prepared for this presentation, I devote several slides to Origins. Of particular note is Fukuyama's focus on institutions, on the contrast between patrimonial systems and legal bureaucratic rational administration in a modern state, on the creation of what he claims is the first modern state system in ancient China, which was later repatrimonialized, and to his dissection of patrimonial and venal office holding in pre-revolutionary France. Fukuyama demonstrates that in 17th and 18th century France, public administration was not just patrimonialized, but I would contend prebendalized. State offices were not just appropriated and used to generate income for their occupants, the offices themselves came to be owned, purchased, sold, and even inherited. Nowhere in post-colonial Africa has such a degree of system systemic prebendalism, except at the very summit of polities, been reached. Over the past three decades, a few authors have taken up the significance of distinguishing prebendalism within the general framework of patrimonial systems, including neo-patrimonialism, which became a catch-all term for peripheral capitalist polities. Having contributed to the application of the neo-patrimonial rubric, Nicholas van der Waller made a shift to the logic of prebendalism, that is, how state offices are appropriated and exploited, and the deleterious consequences of this practice and associated attitudes for the legitimacy and capacity of African states. In his article, Meet the New Boss, Same as the Old Boss, Van der Waller distinguishes African illegal and prebendal arrangements from the patronage politics of mature democracies. He hypothesized optimistically that the former will progressively be replaced by the latter. Van der Waller also identified what he called the toughest question in the politics of contemporary Africa. Prospects for, and I quote, a successful transition that will include the ability to shepherd limited resources into productive public expenditures, notably in social sector investments that promote productivity growth and economic development and accommodative political coalition building. This question is key, I would argue, to moving beyond prebendalist systems. I will list a number of considerations, some of which will be taken up today and others advance for future reflection. First, prebendalist systems, which I first discussed as unique to Nigeria and other post-colonial African countries, is today much more widespread. Indeed, it should now be studied and confronted as a global phenomenon. Two, the rapid expansion of market economies is multiplying incentives to prebendalize national state systems. Three, the investing of corporate and private wealth in politicians and political parties has shaded into the informal purchasing of governmental offices. Four, 
governmental capacity to produce public goods and especially core infrastructure diminishes as a state is prebendalized. Five, once a country falls into the prebendal trap, such as India, Nigeria, and increasingly South Africa, it is extremely difficult to climb back out again. Six, far more research is needed on prebendal processes and methods to enhance civic education and engagement and the use of communication technologies to counteract them. Seven, authoritarian governments such as those of Angola, Ethiopia, and Rwanda may, if they choose, and in fact, this connects with my last talk here on non-democratic um, versus democratic um, systems of developmental governance. All right, so authoritarian governments such as those I mentioned can, if they choose, generate reward systems that establish not the bright line that Fukuyama speaks of between public and private interest, but one that can permit state-run or state-led corporations to expand and prosper, such as Sonangol in Angola, as contrasted with the predatory morass of Nigeria's oil and gas industry. In brief, there may be different mechanisms and capacities to constrain and manage prebendalism in authoritarian and democratic systems. Eight, the role of private sector development in disciplining a venal state system, as argued by Yoran Haydn in No Shortcuts to Progress, his 1983 book, has returned to the agenda in a more challenging way. How, for example, do Nigerian enterprises, whose emergence has been based on milking a prebendal system, become a force for restraining it? And in fact, I have a couple of colleagues working with me um, on a book chapter um, in a project some colleagues at the University of Chicago are doing on corporate social responsibility. And we will be doing one, a chapter, um, on the manufacturing sector in Nigeria and addressing exactly this question. Nine, where state governments and federal agencies are under the leadership of reformist leaders, again taking examples from Nigeria, can the int introducing of legal, rational, bureaucratic norms and methods be made sustainable in light of the prebendal universe in which they operate. 10, physician heal thyself. Uh, by the way, my students is reading, <laughs> read that very recently. A highly relevant chapter in Larry Diamond's Spirit of Democracy prompts a critical question. If prebendalism in Western democratic governments is now matching these practices in non-Western nations, who are the new physicians? How and where will they be trained? What mechanisms will they use, and who will support their work? 11, after the Arab awakening, and of course this is relevant to your conference beginning tomorrow, what are the prospects, for example, in Egypt, of transforming pervasive prebendalist practices? And 12, I was responsible for convening a conference on state market and democracy in Africa. And in fact, Larry took part and helped me put together, um, you know, we brought colleagues from the Caribbean and from Asia, together with African colleagues. But anyway, on state market and democracy um, at Emory University in fall 1998. On the basis of the arguments and ideas presented today, perhaps a similar conference should be held 15 years later in 2013. Okay, um, so let me tell you how I'm gonna proceed uh, with these slides. Um, the, um, I will um, just have very briefly on what's going on in Nigeria today, and, will be familiar to many of you. I just, in fact, have one slide that basically says and some quotes. Um, I have um, some slides um, drawn from that article I wrote in 83 in the book, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them because, like I said, it's really um, making that information available um, to colleagues involved in this project and others in Nigeria who themselves are thinking. Um, I have several slides um, on, uh, from um, Fukuyama's um, origins um, I'll spend a little more time on that. Um, and then um, I will um, have some slides on um, prebendalism um, as, a, um, as a global phenomenon. Um, and just taking from my readings and the same sort of things your readings, but reading them, just showing it through a prebendalist um, framework. And I will conclude um, with some thoughts um, about Nigeria. Because it is so critical, Nigeria in, in, um, in Africa, of course, and some of the challenges um, being faced. Um, this is just a summary here um, of my talking about post-colonial African prebendal system. Larry mentioned it and the importance of it, but these are the, you know, the, the key 
um, characteristics that I um, had um, put forward um, in my book. I'm not going to go forward, but again, you all will have those slides available on the website to be able to, to look at it more closely. Um, here again, these are all taken um, from that book. Um, in my thinking through about prebendalism, the ideas coming out from Max Weber and so on, um, that last statement about uh, um, prebendalism being a qualitatively unique form of status and clientelist political behavior that is ultimately self-destructive. Um, here again, another statement. Many colleagues have cited this because it comes straight out of the book, and I'm reading things that I wrote you know, 25, 30 years ago, but I read them again, and it's still patterns of political um, behavior, the justifying that offices will be used for the benefit of office holders and their reference group, um, and that offices susceptible to individual com communal appropriation. And the fact that whatever laws and regulations um, that exist um, really become of secondary purposes, really fig leaves. Um, this is um, from um, Michael Bratton on democratic experiments in Africa, a statement about neopatrimonial rule. And this again reflects a lot of the thinking about how people use neopatrimonial rule. And you know, so during all the period when people talk, I kept saying, you know, people are not, some people were not really getting um, the whole idea of prebendalism um, within that framework. But anyway, I've put that up there as a classic statement of neopatrimonial rule. Um, the first talk I gave in the series was called The Fight of Our Time, um, taking from what Barack Obama said in Nairobi about the importance of fighting corruption um, and that the importance of transforming prebendalist systems in, when one thought about it. Um, that second chapter, that paragraph, again, comes from my early writings. How do we protect the state power from being prebendalized and squeezed of its resources? Um, this is a statement um, from um, one of the Nigerians commenting on it. Um, and this is just, um, you know, messages he sent out. But it really captures the, this issue of dysfunction and suboptimism. And I'll read through them because I think it really, I could pick dozens from what Nigerians are saying now. That the Nigerian state may be withering away in terms of its sensational incapacity to provide minimal services. And he talks about the national blackout. I refer to the vacuity of political leadership, turning the state arena into one of unprecedented predatory extraction. And this, side, this idea about the weak stature of the country in the global eco knowledge economy. Um, and that for me is a very important concern. You know, I know Larry has been, you know, we have worked with younger scholars, so important to us. But how do you actually address these challenges if in fact the whole university educational systems have been so eroded? And then finally, a direct linkage between the criminalization of the state and the looting gangs and the activities in the Niger Delta and the north of the country. And we can talk about it, that a little bit more um, you know, in the question and answer. Now, the Fukuyama, and now this is Fukuyama time for several slides here. Um, the primacy of institutions. Um, we tend to take institutions for granted. Um, and these important categories of state, rule of law, accountable government. Institutions that are products of historical circumstances, but the difficulty of replicating them in different, in different societies. And this idea, new institutions are typically layered on top of existing <laughs> ones. And again, as I look at the situation in Nigeria and other countries, the way in which you have those institutions brought in, but it's a very important phrase of how they become layered on top. Um, the Viberian state in ancient China, for, I think for many of us, this was really an eye-opener, what he had to say about the state of kin and the Chinese bureaucracy um, and where the state is not regarded um, as private property and, and you know, all of the points you know, are there. And AJ, you know, this, his, his, his claim that China alone created a modern state as defined by Max Weber, China invented a system of merit-based bureaucratic recruitment. Then the patrimonial tug. Um, that, um, you know, that with the, the kin state, how it was recaptured um, by different patrimonial elites, the weakening of the central government, and the return of kinship as a pri primary avenue to power and status. Now, when I'm reading Fukuyama, is like, what am I reading? You know, I'm, re I'm reading Fukuyama, and I'm reading the contemporary politics that we have been studying. Kinship and patrimony reinserted themselves as the organizing principles, um, and then the inverse correlation, and so on. Confronting patrimonialism that impersonal modern states, difficult institutions to establish, and that patrimonialism 
recruitment based on kinship or personal recipro reciprocity will revert in the absence of other norms and incentives. And then that the most universal form of human political interaction is a patron-client relationship. Constant pressure to repatrimonialize the system. You know, I've read a lot of reviews of your book, but I just, I've not read anybody who has really picked up on what was being said um, that I am just pulling out there that is so relevant. Um, Fukuyama in Africa. Um, that, you know, most people would prefer to live in a society in which your government was accountable and effective. And in fact, this is one quote that you'll see I've, I've used twice because it's so important. And a few governments are able to do both, institutions are weak, corrupt, lacking capacity, some cases absent altogether. And then tribalism, in its various forms, uh, remains a default form of political organization even after a modern state has been created. You know, and I went back into one of the early things I write that uh, quoted Abner Cohen, anthropologist, and basically saying, you know, what the same thing that, you know, Fukuyama, I mean, saying here, that ethnicity becomes one type of political grouping within the framework of the modern state. All right, getting to Denmark, again, this is a wonderful idea. I sometimes talk about um, with Norwegian, with Nigeria, how, we, how do we make Nigerians Norwegians? You know, it's the way I tend to put it, but well, we'll use Denmark, getting to Denmark, stable, democratic, peaceful. Do you have any Denmarks here? Oh, Danish here? We do, we do. And, we do? Uh, we have found right. at CDDRL that the way to get to Denmark is to bring them here. Bring them here. All right. So anyway, so getting to Denmark, um, I've been talking to my students about that. But anyway, extremely low levels of political corruption. And the getting to Denmark is not only, of course, for Africa, but my goodness, if we knew how to get to Denmark from where we are in this country right now. All right, France's ancien regime, I mean, this is just this, I mean, you know, those of us who thought we, we knew something about France and the whole history, I just found this mind-blowing. Um, reading uh, what he had to say. The actual purchase of small pieces of the state, and this idea that I have talked about so often about the, taking the state and getting hold of pieces of it and so on. Government offices sold to the highest bidder, um, government privatized down to its core functions, public offices turned into heritable private property. Um, you know, <coughs> patrimonial office holding, venal office holding. In fact, I put in the word prebendal because this is, what it, this is a prebendal system. And then the rent, you know, that where the origins of this, word, of this word came from. Selling of public offices to private individuals, then entitled officers to a revenue stream. And the Paulette, um, and then the rent holder could convert this into heritable property. So this is just, you know, amazing to me, um, understanding it from this perspective. Now this created an absolute nightmare. Um, legitimized and institutionalized rent seeking and corruption, allowing agents to run their public offices for private benefits. Now, if public administration is about the observance of a bright line between <coughs> public and private, the ancien regime represented a thoroughly pre-modern system. Right? The French state, again, I mean, those familiar with my writings would just see, my goodness, what is Fukuyama talking about here? You know, this sounds so much like, you know, like the Nigeria I was grappling with. A curious, unstable combination <laughs> of modern and, oh, no, no, volume two is really incorporated in volume one we all, we know, as we're reading it. Um, you know, um, a, a curious, unstable combination of modern and patrimonial emperors. And then that, you know, um, um, state offices bought, exploited, and so on, property rights in public office. And so I give the term French prebendalism in terms of what um, Fukuyama is talking about. And it has to do with tax farming. Many of us have associated with tax farming. But to know the way in which that tax farming and where the state now had to find ways to, um, you know, to... To, to, to depress the price of offices. I mean, this is the state really becoming a market. Um, and the authority of the state um, built by empowering a coalition of these rent-seeking um, elites. Right? And then finally, that a modern France would not emerge unless venal office holding was replaced by impersonal merit-based bureaucracy. Right? And this is the challenge we face in Nigeria and many other countries. How do we replace venal office holding by impersonal merit-based bureaucracy. Well, Fukuyama tells us how, the, how the, the French did it, all right? It came about through the French Revolution. Um, and this is some more about the prebendalist trap um, that in terms of right down, in fact, talking about provincial offices and how, they, how the whole system operated. Yeah. But again, I have all of that um, online. Um, it, of course, it's in Fukuyama, but this has really been pulled out uh, highlighted. Now moving before beyond prebendalism and the re-establishing of this bright line between public and private list uh, interest. 
and public, getting political office be based on merit and in personality. Uh, and he stated that, you know, that this was not going to be involved, um, the, the Max Weber system, um, out of that patrimonial office holding. This is very important. Once you have that system of venal patrimonialized you know, office holding and become so entrenched, how do you move logically out of that kind of a system, that kind of a logic? Right? How do you get this break with that tradition? Um, I'm not going to spend time here, but here after Fukuyama, now I could go back to my Nigeria, and I have a few slides just talking about, about Nigeria state and society, and it's really reflecting. FF, of course, refused to Fuk Fukuyama, you know, just pulling in some of ideas um, into this. But I'll go through this very quickly because, like I said, this is, I'm really putting it here because I worked in it. I want to make it available to others. Um, and um, that final statement, when the state itself becomes a key distributor of financial resources, all governmental objects become the object of intense pressure to convert them into means of individual and, and uh, communal appropriation. Again, these are more fund basic statements um, from my book. Um, I wouldn't spend much time on them here. Um, you know, again, I talked a little bit about that. I want to go through this quickly. The Conglomerate Society, um, there was a book um, by Ken Post and Michael um, Vickers, um, which I have recently gone back to read. Um, and I find it, you know, his, the ideas about a conglomerate society. In fact, in the talk I gave at Brown University um, last month, I, I took the, um, the, um, the um, election results in Nigeria in April 2011 and showed the pattern of it. And the pattern of it is conglomerate society voting, right, in Nigeria. And again, I won't spend much time. So, the ethno-regional voting. When he talked about the way these sections, these cultural sections. So, you know, I find this is, you know, really important. that we really, Nigeria is now really stuck also in this conglomerate pattern. Um, again, I won't spend time here, but this is about the, the impediment that prebendalism represents to the idea of democracy voting. And this last sentence, um, my concern to analyze these dynamics, what paths can lead from a more stable, efficient, and democratic polity. Now, I said that 25 years ago. Um, um, sadly to say, I wish I was coming to you all now and told you I, I had identified the paths, right? Um, again, um, more, some more statements from the book about prebendalism and economic growth, how it undercuts it. But just look at that last sentence that I have at the bottom here. This is from the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics. You have a lot of information, what I call the progress narrative about all the growth and per capita income growth in Nigeria. But look at the situation in Nigeria. That in Nigeria, that in 20, 61% of Nigerians, almost 100 million people, earn less than a dollar a day. Now the World Bank and others, you know, there for extreme poverty is $1.25 a day. So they're using $1 a day, right? And you're, they're saying that, you know, two thirds of Nigerians, and that there has been a 10% increase in poverty during that period. And this is a time of, you know, what we're having in terms of oil income. So just think of the situ situation. There was a recent front page article, many of you have been seeing, about the, the demographic situations in, in Nigeria and other countries where we're not seeing that demographic shift, all right, in terms of, of fertility, which means the populations are going up. But could you imagine, a, you know, the population is going up and you're having these kinds of results. Now, um, the, the prebendalism as a, as a global phenomenon. Um, I'll just go through some of these examples. This is the U.S. Um, Stanley was the CEO of this big firm, KPR, um, pleaded guilty to bribing Nigerian officials in return for $6 billion in contracts. Siemens, Halliburton also. Um, and in fact, negotiated fines under the Foreign um, Corrupt Practices Act now is in fact becoming part of the cost of doing business. So you really have a second level. There is the commissions that are paid, the bribes in all kinds of forms are paid, and the anticipatory bribes in terms you are found out, and in fact settling it, you know, because, you know, rather than doing it, and of course, you know, the, the capacity to deal with it. The World Bank estimates is one trillion in bribes paid annually. In Africa alone, 148 billion is signed off, I siphoned annually. Um, this, um, this review that I uh, was reading of um, that, that book by Catherine Bu, when he talks about the proliferation of, of gray zones as part of this, you know, this success narrative. We, we're moving from the Fukuyama's you know, bright line to, in fact, gray zones, gray lines you know, uh, no between it. All. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, the United States here, I mean, this is just a statement about you know, land of rent seekers. Jack Abramoff's recent book 
All right, here Jack Abramoff has gone to jail and come out. And Jack Abramoff is telling you how he does it. And when you read what Jack Abramoff is saying of the systematic process, building personal relations, um, going after congressional offices, and I call it suborning of congressional chiefs of staff. And he said, once he sort of um, suggested to, 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 um, to, you know, made that connection, he says, every move that staffer made, he made with his future in my firm in mind. Um, the, 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 the cycling that's now taking place between people serving in Congress and so on and, um, and lobbying firms are amazing. And of course, Friedman had this statement, I had to stick in here. It's become a form of legalized uh, bribery. Um, India, again from Fukuyama, and this is from Fukuyama volume one, not two, <laughs> that democratic India finds it extremely difficult to fix its crumbling infrastructure in all these ways. Um, and then there is this, um, this fellow who visited India and he was reporting back so about Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. said they're losing millions of rub rupees that could be used for road repairs. In fact, he had this wonderful uh, truck drivers driving along and not even stopping, just throwing down the 100 rupee note for the police to, to gather it up. Um, railway clerks systematically diverting rupees. But look, in the same series of, that I have there in March, the government increased the passenger and freight fares to be able to improve the decline railway stock. And then the railway minister, minister is forced to resign because of the, the, the you, know, um, you know, trying to do that. You just think of getting locked into that. And of course, from Catherine Boo, Beyond the Beautiful Tomorrows, um, of how this is locked in. Russia, of course, we know it. Um, I just picked this one case having to do with the tax rebate scam. Um, you know, the fellow who, um, the lawyer who died in jail um, as a consequence and so on. Uh, and just showing the way in which that, um, that scam really operates. And in fact, it's really a, a criminalized state and a prebendal form of, of tax farming that's taking place. And you can take so many examples from Russia today. China, um, you know, um, the Bo July and Good, the whole affair has now blown up in demonstrating um, what is actually, uh, you know, taking place, um, you know, in China. Uh, I don't even have to spend time with that because it's so obvious. Um, um, the, um, Lydia Paul Green had a long article on, on South Africa recently. Um, and in fact, the, the core point was, was how quickly South Africa has caught up with the rest of Africa in this way. Um, and she went to Limpopo province and showing how the, you know, the, the water system, the electricity, and how it is, you know, it, things are not working uh, as a result of the corruption. And, and Becky, you know, say all over the country. Um, government audits, this is their, 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 their auditing office, and three of 39 government departments were pronounced clean in audits. In other words, 36 of, of 39 were, were dirty. Um, and look at the number of, of cities. <laughs> Um, all right, so South Africa has really become the whole entanglement process there. Um, this is from Lionel Barber, who made a trip to Ghana and Nigeria, and he ended up, after looking at that, he ended up just saying the things that we know about. At the end of the day, all of the progress that he's seen, he said, but at the end of the day, we're just dealing with, um, with the petty bribes and the politicians involved in, 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 in channeling state funds. Uganda, we have six government ministers have fought to resign investigation for graft. And by the way, one of my concerns I don't talk a bit about here is what happened with oil and gas in a lot of Africa now, a lot of those discoveries right around the continent, um, what the implications going to do. Um, Angola, we have um, you know, senior officers and with Goldman Sachs back the employer. Um, Walmart, I mean, it's almost like I, I, you know, I, I don't need any more cases, guys. It's enough, you know. Um, they look at the whole Walmart um, experience, um, you know, that the whole process. Of, of, of how it's not just, I, I mean, we know, in fact, I was recently in Mexico and the, the difficulty people have in getting permits to do things, the bribes, but when you see an organization like Walmart coming in and really, you know, adding to the process in this kind of a way. All right, I have, I'm going to conclude with a few uh, slides on Nigeria and the Nigerian predicament uh, today. Um, and um, I describe Nigeria as a feckless democracy. Um, using, you know, term used by Carruthers. And the question is, how does it become an effective democracy? And this is from a, a piece I was reading on Inglehart and Rosa. The problems in Nigeria, the population growth, the infrastructure, woeful education. We have economic expansion along with increase in poverty. The crime insecurity and terrorism. We have mega corruption together with what I call toll gate corruption. All of those continue the same thing. We have plutocracy. 
Um, the oligarchs that we know in Nigeria, extreme rich, together with mass deprivation. We have some dynamic leaders in Nigeria, and then we have venal leaders, and we have conglomerate electoral politics. So the whole Nigerian morass, <laughs> um, you know, how do you make advance given, um, you know, what you're dealing with here? Um, Nigeria has continued to deepen as a prebendal republic. Um, the chapter two of my book um, was entitled A Democracy That Works. Um, um, Shawarsky, um, from um, his 1993 article, said, um, we need to know the conditions under which democ democratic institutions work and endure. And then went on, I went on to say, by work I mean, um, how do they bring about desired effects in terms of growth, material security, freedom from arbitrary violence. In the forthcoming volume, I've only picked out one phrase from the whole volume. And this is by Nigeria's leading political scientists. And unfortunately, like many of Nigeria's leading scholars, they are not in Nigeria. They have to go abroad. And Rotimi Subaru, and he says the Nigerian federal system operates almost exclusively as a mechanism for the intergovernmental distribution and ethno-political appropriation of centrally collected oil revenues. Um, and now I describe this, I always have to come up with, I guess, the ways to, you know, I don't know, to, uh, to, uh, to amuse myself maybe, come up with ways. But oil bunkering is a term in Nigeria. Oil bunkering is a process by which um, you have the oil industry, and, and, it, and, and oil bunkering, you have tens of thousands of oil that is, is exported from Nigeria, um, refined, and so on. This is, a, this is a, a really big business and shipped out alongside the major operations. Um, and so the oil bunkering is that you basically you tap into the, 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 the pipelines and so on. Um, so I talked about Nigeria having a system of political bunkering. Uh, you tap into an artery of the state and suction revenues. When it dries up, you find another artery. How do you get closer to Denmark? I've repeated that phrase um, from, uh, from Fukuyama um, that I mentioned earlier. Now, um, in the, when I spoke at Brown, um, Last month, I talked about Nigeria 2025 project. Um, in, you know, I, I was interviewed a few months ago on, on, uh, on our local national public radio. And after this interview, the interviewer asked me, said, now, are you optimistic about Nigeria? <laughs> and I said, I am always optimistic. Um, and so my optimism, I call it Nigeria 2025 project. Um, and it's what kind of a Nigerian model of designing accountable and effective government. I look at what is happening in Lagos State um, after 1999. We could talk about that under first Governor Tinubu and now um, Governor Fashola and the way we have some dynamic governors trying to do that. And the central challenge is how we move from prebendal to inclusive and effective democratic governance. In the case of Nigeria, Nigeria is a country that has a lot of resources. I'm not just talking about the oil resources, the, you know, the, you know, the agricultural potential and all of it. Um, but it also have institutionally the resources um, that Nigeria needs, opportunities. And so I've just put down what are some of the ways in which you can mobilize some of those resources in Nigeria. Um, and of course, the central challenge in terms of education. Um, and uh, this is the final slide um, about a Nigeria 2025 project involving collaborative learning and action. And of course, this talk and others I've given is part of that process. Um, first, is thinking of Nigeria after the return of the military in 1999, um, and thinking of ourselves as, in the, as halfway through that process. Um, I, th I call it a 26-year marathon, um, in which Nigeria is at that midway point. Um, in two years' time, Nigeria will be celebrating, I wrote a recent piece, I said people will either celebrate or be mourning the amalgamation. So in two years time, Nigeria will be confronting how Nigeria came together in that amalgamation. Um, then we have the elections in April 2015. Uh, there were massive riots after the last elections, all right? There were several hundred people killed. After every, so when think of Nigeria going into those elections, Based on all of it, I think this is going to be a major challenge of Nigeria going through those elections. And good luck, Jonathan, has promised to only serve one term, which, again, really, <laughs> you know, one elected. one elected term, right? Which um, really, again, complicates it. I refer to the northern schism um, and terrorism in Nigeria. You all be aware of it. 
Um, the possibility of South-South learning, this is one of the points I've made a lot in terms of large, complex democracies, Brazil and India and Indonesia and Nigeria in terms of learning from that. So the question is, what tried, what worked, what failed? And finally, um, the, you know, some of the, 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 the resources that we do have available to us, and Larry told me this is something that he is looking at in terms of some of his work, is the innovations through communication technologies. All of that is opening up now um, in terms of um, you know, empowerment. All right, folks, so I mean, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Richard, let me begin with a conceptual question or issue. Um, uh, I have a bit of a